Welcome to episode 55 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thanks so much for joining me. Very special episode today. Willie Garson, Martin Lloyd of Stargate SG-1 will be joining us in just a moment here. But before we get started, if you enjoy Stargate or you have fans who enjoy Stargate, it would really make a great deal to me if you would consider subscribing to the show. Click the like icon, definitely, uh, to get us started here. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please also consider giving, um, lending the, the link for this show to a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click that subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on both the gateworld.net and YouTube channels. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in Mr. Willie Garson here in just a moment. The run of the show is going to be, I'll have uh, some questions uh, for Willie about uh, his experiences in uh, the show, life, acting, his career, his personal heroes and influences. If you're in the YouTube chat at uh, youtube.com slash dial the gate, uh, you'll be able to submit questions as well, and I'll get them over to him. And uh, then afterwards, we'll have a, a wrap-up. So I appreciate you tuning in. Without further ado, Mr. Willie Garson, Martin Lloyd. Oh, my God. How are you, sir? Hello there. Uh, I'm I'm well. Thank you. Thank Good. you so much for having me. Thank you for being on. Uh, it's uh, You were in such important episodes of this show it's 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 shame on me for not reaching out to you until now my friend this is this is great to have you how dare you yes i yes. was thinking horrible thoughts about you uh, <laughs> <great>. martin <laughs> willie what is it like uh you know anyone turn on uh turn on the television uh, someone will have, have seen you in something what is it like uh being such a critical piece to the most important episodes, the milestones of uh, of this this franchise. Well, I and mean, being it, such it a character that everyone has loved. Well, it, it was kind of amazing because it's not obviously how it started, and it's a huge uh, compliment which I take from them. I I just did that one episode, basically, and uh, it was uh, really you know a great character who's he's an alien. He doesn't know that he's an alien. Um, that's, that's all wonderful. And then Rick and I got along very, very well. Yeah. And, uh, then out of nowhere, I don't know how it was, it was not soon after it was like years later. Uh, we get a phone call that like, Hey, we're going to do our hundredth episode and we're going to have a little bit of fun. And, um, we're basically going to make every joke that anyone could possibly make about a science fiction show uh, and we're going to do it through you. I, so there, there's a couple of reasons for that. They liked me very much and I, I fit in with the crew and the cast very well uh, when I was there the first time. Um, but also they thought it was really funny and perfect that I'm not a sci-fi person. <laughs> so I've done every science fiction show uh, other than I guess Babylon 5 or something. But I've done, I've done all of them, and I don't watch any of it. I don't know anything about science fiction. Um, when I was a kid, I we would go to the Star Trek conventions, uh, but it was really because it was combined with the Planet of the Apes convention. So I was <laughs> more interested in Planet of the Apes. Um, and then when I did, like when I did Star Trek, I'd never seen an episode ever. Oh, so and same with Stargate, and same with X Files, and same with Quantum Leap, and say, I mean, it's like I, I, I'm just not that guy. So I think they love that about me uh, to then have me make these hilarious episode that they were going to make for their hundred. Um, and then and then we got the call, you know, years later. <laughs> The agent calls and says, they love you. They love using you. I'm like, they haven't called in five years. What are you talking about? Like, um, but anyway, it was great. And and I I don't know if the first one um the Point no return, episode, season four. Yeah, but the first the hundredth episode, Wormhole Extreme, I guess. Season five. Um 
so uh, was Rick gone already? No, he he uh, started uh, phasing out his time in season six, then a little bit more season seven, a little bit more season eight, and by and nine and ten back, he was came gone. back to the two hundredth, which was right. great. Um, that was really cool, and uh, I had I I got to work with Bo Bridges, who yes. would later would later join us on White Collar for a little bit. Um, so that it, 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 you know, the whole experience is great. The crew is amazing. Uh, I love shooting in Vancouver. Um, I remember that first episode specifically because I had never shot in Vancouver in the summer. <laughs> and it was so glorious because the show was really uh, crew and cast friendly as well. And they would shoot until normal like six, seven o'clock at night. Yeah. And then the summer in Vancouver, you have a whole nother day because it doesn't get dark until 10, 10 30 at night. So you could go for a run or a bike ride or a hike up a mountain. And I, I just thought that was so civilized to shoot in Vancouver when it's not miserable there. Cause that's the only other time I had shot there <laughs> was when it was freezing cold and dark at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Vancouver has all kinds of sides to it. You know, I mean, that the, it's interesting. You can tell like when in in the season the show is when they go into the outdoors and the GVRD and are the trees bare or are they covered? OK, so when, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. what planet is this? Well, it's Vancouver in the winter. So I do remember the big event uh, of that of my first episode. Um, you know, because I, I don't understand any of it. I'm too stupid. I don't understand anything about these storylines. And I, I did play the import of me walking through the gate. I remember it being such a big deal. And everyone, and everyone on the crew and like, oh my, oh my God, he's gonna walk through the gate. Martin mm -hmm. gets to walk through the gate. And it was like the hugest deal. And I, so I just played that with literally no idea what was going on. Like, <laughs> You have no idea how many guest performers have been around for so many seasons of that show, multiple series, and have never had a shot of them going through the Stargate. And like yeah. many of them, it's implied that they're off world, but we don't get to see the scene and they don't rotoscope them out, you know, right. or do the right. in right. post production. You got to do it twice. Yeah, it was, it was, I could tell that it was a big deal. Um, and it was uh, of import to the show. And then the other episodes, I knew what they were doing. And I just thought it was terrific to be to be that uh, open and hilarious and and uh, in touch with the fans. Like, I just thought they did an incredible job on those episodes. <laughs> like, because, um, you know, people think that uh, a lot of people think like sci -fi people, sci fi people are like weird and like zombies walking around. <laughs> like that are not rooted in reality. And I was, I was really, I love the way the, uh, the, the writers um, really address that like uh, freely and hilariously knowing that their fans are not zombies. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I mean, you know, and it's Stargate strikes a balance. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's in the here and now, I mean, your Voyager. Right. It's, so very is... rooted, it's very rooted in current reality. Exactly. As well as the, uh, right. It has That's the glory of the show, though. You know? Correct. It has the benefit of uh, sending us to another world and allowing us to use a metaphor. I mean, uh, your Voyager episode is one of my favorites. I mean, you may not be a, a Monean living underneath a, an ocean planet, but uh, you know, in this in this circumstance, it was a it was a chance to tell a story about a group of people who f f uh, left their world to try and go get help, and ended up, you know, being deserters. So well, I mean, I think, we see the I consequences think, of that. I think what's interesting, I was just writing about this and I was writing about, I'm writing a book about everything. Oh. And, uh, and when I got to the Stargate section uh, is when it really hit me. I mean, it's why I've done a lot of science fiction because basically it's palatable and moving and important is that at the end of the day, it's all rooted in human contact and emotion. So it could be someone from another planet, but it ends up being the humanity that makes it, it makes it get saved or makes them move forward or whatever it is. But it all is rooted in humanity. And that's why people are drawn to it. Um, 
you know, Star Trek was ridiculous. I'd never seen an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> and there were people on the crew who literally, literally have been working there since 1968. Yeah. Do you hear my doorbell? Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I thought it was a clock. <laughs> um, getting just a, getting an Amazon package? Delivery. Yeah, mm. I'll be back in one second. Okay. One second. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe it's the CIA coming to finally get Martin. <laughs> the beauty of doing it live, folks. Anything can happen. Oh, my candle just burnt out. So I totally recommend these Yankee candles, uh, except for this one, because uh, I cannot get the damn thing to light. So Midsummer's ah. Night. That's what this one's called. I'm back. Sorry. You're all good. Um, so sci-fi is, sci is a lens. It's a lens into us and the human condition yeah, yeah. for sure. And I mean, I, I like to make uh Danny, come on in. Come sit down over, over there, away from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, sit over here so you can participate. <laughs> <laughs> is that your son? So it's it. No, my son's in college. This oh, okay. is my son. He's, um, he's special. Oh, um, okay. So, <laughs> but but you know, the, like the big joke I would make on Stargate and on like Star Trek is because I don't know anything that anyone's saying. I don't know what anything means ever. So they would we do a take and they'd say cut, and I would like announce to everyone if they would just stop stopping us, we could have been to sick bay by now. <laughs> and and then I would get this removed. <laughs> <laughs> and that. So that was, I mean, you know, it's funny, like, like Richard Dean Anderson is like such an old pro. I think he really appreciated me being there, this other side of, of, of like, of uh, non-awareness of all of it. He's not crazy about sci-fi either, but he gets into it yeah. because he loves the characters and he loves the people. Yeah, you know? yes. Well, I mean, there are no fans like that. Like in any other realm uh, of entertainment. I mean, you can do one episode of something and be like, make a whole career out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Absolutely. I did. I did a convention. There was a guy in the, in the booth next to me who had done like one episode of Deep Space Nine, and he does like conventions every weekend. Like mm -hmm. it's crazy. That's crazy. Like level of commitment from fans, and that there's yeah, well, yeah. There's 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 enough of an interest in that community to keep that guy going, you know. And yeah. it's so nice when you when you meet people that uh, uh, have been a part of a project uh, that has inspired you in some way or gotten you through a difficult time or something like that. And uh, the uh, the experience is a positive one because it's not always the case. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. It is not always the case. You're not wrong. Right. <laughs> how how did you get involved in your craft? What made you fall in love with acting? I was a kid, so easily fallen in love. Um, and, uh, you know, so I started working when I was 13. So uh, I, someone in my town, they were casting a play in New York and they needed a 13 year old kid. So I went in, I'd done like school plays and stuff. I went in and auditioned and I got it. And they hired three of us so we could rotate performances. Okay. Um, uh, the play was called The Winslow Boy. The role was The Winslow Boy, which sounds very fancy, but the kid is literally asleep on the couch for the entire play. I think oh my he had God. Um, so they rotated us and then I was like hooked. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't go on film until I was in my 20s or 21 when I came to California, that's when I started working in film and TV. Wow. Any uh, particular highlights over the course of your career where you have tackled a character that surprised you in ways that you didn't expect or forced you to grow in directions that you didn't anticipate? Uh, de definitely. It would be, it would be sex in the city because it has, <laughs> it has. So much and, uh, so, and it's completely different than the way I auditioned for it. So uh, that, just everything. And now, you know, it looks like we're going to get a chance to revisit that again. Um, and it's going to be very different. I mean, I haven't done it in 12 years and the world has changed and the viewpoints have changed and 
I'm, I'm excited to see what they've written, like how these people have matured and changed and become exactly uh, much more evolved. It's going to be, it's, uh, these are going to be very different stories for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I just heard about that announcement like a couple of days ago. It's like, wow, you know, Stanford yeah. might be coming back. So yeah, might be, we're almost done. We're almost there. We're almost there. Absolutely. Tell us about um, getting involved in Stargate. You know, it was an offer. So I, okay. I don't, I didn't audition for it. So I don't remember how the offer came, but I was like, that's awesome. Like I, lo I love Richard Dean Anderson, who I didn't know yet. And uh, Vancouver in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I knew the show was very popular. And I had really just been doing my kind of round of the science fiction. Mm -hmm. round. So, you know, I'm the only person who's done two episodes of Quantum Leap. I'm the only person who did two X-Files. Uh, and then Star Trek. I don't know if Star Trek had happened yet um, when I did the first one. But yeah, it was you know, around was, exactly around the same time. Yeah, around the same time. Yeah. And uh, so it was very, you know, it was, it was like interesting to me. And then I went up and literally just fell in love with Rick like the first day because he was like saying shitty things about <laughs> science fiction <laughs> to like whispering in my ear, like, uh, you know, like, oh, don't don't fall off the Milky Way or something. Like, I mean, it was like literally <laughs> whispering things in my ear. Like, and, I, and I'm like, I don't know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly in a hotel like, room bathroom. Yeah, hotel like, room bathroom. I mean, luckily, my character didn't know that he was an alien. So he, he suspected that he was, but he couldn't prove it. Right. <laughs> but he's operating on a plane of reality more so. Exactly. So Most, mostly drugged. His, his, yeah, there uh, you go. Which yeah, I, he was you know. using all kinds of, all, all kinds of different uh, things. How was it d discovering this character who was so off the wall and a, a, in many ways a caricature of the... Uh... Why, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, no, a caricature of... <laughs> I'm trying to be kind to my community um, of of the more interesting members of us, you know, who can believe in, you know, the. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know what I what, what worked for me is because I know nothing about the show or or science fiction was his innocence. Yeah, that's what I was ended up playing. And even when in the other episodes, when he becomes this kind of asshole producer. <laughs> Uh, this kind of stock character of asshole producer. Um, I, I liked, there was still an innocence about him that he has no idea that these stories are coming to him uh, because they're actually from his former life uh, <laughs> in, in the cosmos or beyond, pardon me to use your phrase, beyond the gate. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And Christopher Judge. Oh, great. I loved him. I loved him. He was Great. so cool. And, that, and the poor guy with all the makeup, uh, that guy, you know, I, I, my heart felt for him uh, because, as you know, from, from Star Trek, I went through it. You, the set, well, then, you yeah, went much more. I mean, you were a... I, mine was uh, four hours on and two hours off every day. As Riga? Uh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but, you know, that Chris Judd, that he had to do that every day. Mm -hmm. was like, are you kidding me right now? I mean, it probably took, I'm sure they got it down to like an hour probably to put it on. Right. And then whatever it took to take it off. But Dip his face every, in gold. Every single day. Mm -hmm. I mean, who was the guy on Star Trek? Uh, Ethan Phillips played him. Elix, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, that guy was in like, you know, his entire experience of that show was being in makeup. Like that, that was his entire life was being in makeup and taking off makeup. <laughs> it's a lot of craziness. I hope he makes a ton of money in, at conventions. I, yeah, Ethan, I think does a, does a pretty reasonable job indeed for sure. Yeah. Cause that's hazard pay. <laughs> right. Exactly. So yeah. after um, season four, season five, they brought you, they brought you back uh, for 200. Did, did you get any uh, for, for uh wormhole extreme initially, did they provide any insight in terms of some of the, some yeah. of the in jokes that you were uh, in, invited to partake in, in, in terms of yeah, I mean, your character's if, development? If, like, what does this mean? This is referencing something. Well, you know, it was great. Cause it was kind of written. I mean, the jokes about the actual show, I, they had to explain all of them to me. I think Deloise was there. I think he was yes. explaining to me. But 
but I just love that it was user friendly. It was every joke that someone who's not a science fiction fan would make about the show. <laughs> and I love that they did that and that they brought me to do it. And that and that it resonated so much with fans, like that they weren't like holding it so precious, like, oh, you can't joke about you know, the lost city of Oregon or whatever. I have no idea. I'm just thinking that. Atlantis, like, right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And here it is. Right, exactly. But that's what the show did so well. It, it could tell serious stories with, with more serious episodes, but at the end of the day, it never took itself too seriously. Well, they're, you're not taking themselves seriously any, by hiring me. They've already made that decision to not take themselves too serious. <laughs> so, so this is not going to be a very special episode, uh, you know, where I'm dying because I've been bitten by a tribble or whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> like, but like, it's oh going to be, God. it's going to be more, it's going to be more like a wink at the audience by having, certainly by having me back uh, for the hundred, and then the two hundred. I mean, the the two hundred really took me by surprise. But I would think I, so. I think they were like making, they were going to make a Stargate movie at that time. And it was like, so, uh, but that was like, I, I wasn't kidding when I had that conversation. My agent called and said, they love you. They want to bring you back again. And it was like, it's been five years. They don't <laughs> love me that much. Uh, so, but it, but it was, you know, what a, what a joy. And everyone like all excited there's a different energy on a set when it's like, oh, we're making a special episode. Uh, you know, Bobby's getting a new leg, you know, or whatever. <laughs> like a special episode, a special episode energy surrounds us all set. And that's really great to be there for, you know. Well, how many shows make it to 100 episodes is one thing. How many make now, it to 200? Now like, now like zero. Now like zero. Yeah, you know, because only 10 episodes like a season or whatever, but exactly. 200 shows. 200 I mean, is a lot. That's a ton okay. of material. And what an honor to be brought back in for. We we went up to the, the it's, they hadn't uh, yet shot season uh, uh, season 10, episode 7 or 8, whichever one it was. It's yet They hadn't yet shot 200 and they were prepping for it. And we sat down with Brad and Rob and we said, are you guys bringing Willie Garson back? And they're like, Oh yeah. I'm like, yes. Well, here's the thing. They were not going to. And because you said that they made the call. <laughs> there we go. Well, I, you know, I'm happy to, I owe you I'm at your Canadian service. Dollars. Just some Canadian dollars heading your way. <laughs> Jeez, man. Almost you... valueless. Anyway, <laughs> oh my gosh. All money at this point. Jeez. Yeah. Um, what was it like to then flip it on its head because in in the 100th episode you had the the common sci-fi tropes and in 200 it was specifically about all of the stargate in jokes from all 199 well, they, episodes well, before well, well they had been banking them i mean they had so many at that point 200 episodes worth um i just look at them like the the development of the character at 100, he's kind of an asshole because he's going to be a TV producer. And this is how he thinks TV producers operate. And then in 200, now they're going to make the movie. <laughs> now he's going to be in the movies. And now he's just become a total like Hollywood asshole. <laughs> so, so I like got to ramp it up to be a bigger douchebag. <laughs> Did you feel the intensity of the number of scenes that they were having to create over the that uh, couple week time frame it's the biggest episode that really for, stargate's done for 200 for 200 did you well, or I was mean, that you know I not present felt, in that briefing room well i definitely felt that they were gearing up towards the end and that they had a lot of things to answer uh, so it was definitely that there was a lot of stuff going on. And I thought, I just remember, I don't remember the exact scene, but I remember this is really big. There's going on in this one scene. Um, I think it's, and De Deloise is in that scene, but there's like bodies everywhere. Yes. And I just thought, this is huge. This is really huge. Bigger than the average, uh, you know, basic cable show, basically, right. which what it was at the time. 
it's just some what an, what an achievement you know to be to be a part of that for for yeah it was, it was lovely and they're lovely people i'm still friends with them I'm still friends with brad and rob um i don't see rick uh, ever he's a recluse in malibu he does his I'm own like, thing yeah <laughs> he's a free spirit he's a free spirit Absolutely. i mean he's a diver damn it he can do whatever he wants that's exactly right you know for sure i have uh, some fan questions uh, do it. that are here for you Teresa, uh, do you think that there's a chance that there are aliens on Earth right now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, who else can I ask this to? I know one will. Um, yeah, I mean, there could be. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what we'll see what Rover uh, brings back. Aren't they aren't they hanging out on Mars? <laughs> yeah, we just landed. <laughs> during, um... The timing is everything during an international pandemic. I'm glad we're spending money on that. But <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, maybe they'll bring back something. You know, were aliens to show up right now, I would about expect now for that to happen. I, I had aliens for October of last year and I didn't get my wish. Oh, uh, well, well, I'll make you a bet if you want. Okay. By by April. <laughs> by I'm, April. I'm saying no. <laughs> by what, April, what side no. are you taking them? I'm not taking that action. <laughs> okay, good. So Dan Zimmer, uh, Zimmerly. So uh, well, we we can anticipate uh, uh, Stanford coming back for Sex in the City. We can anticipate it, <laughs> but I cannot say it's actually happening quite okay. yet. Okay. So there we can we go. ask that question in a week. <laughs> All right. Jet Ison. Was it fun acting as a human alien, not having to wear the cumbersome outfits, outfits and, and makeup like you had to do for Riga? So much better. I highly recommend if you're going to be an alien, put yourself in human form. Don't <laughs> put things on your face with glue. <laughs> much better to not have glue on your face. Would you not uh, do another character that had um, extensive uh, prosthetics? Well, at the time, like for Star Trek, it the, just in just in overtime and forced calls. With forced call is when you're not given twelve hours off, but they could never give me twelve hours off because I was in makeup all the right. time. So I never made more money on a on an episode of television as that episode. Wow, that that extensive in terms of the makeup I time. Say, I would say five times my salary. Wow. So at the time Jeez. when I was living on ramen noodles, that's what that's what aliens eat, by the way. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I uh, I was really appreciative of that job. So it's like, sure, you want to glue crap on my head for five hours? Go for it. Like, Pay me to do it. Every day. Yeah, do it every day. <laughs> and they did every day. And to make a great story. Yeah. I slept there too. By the way, I slept in my dressing room. You did? Yeah. Because I my call time was like three in the morning. Well, then yeah, screw that. You know, I mean, if it's already I set up, makeup, and then I work till nine, ten o'clock at night, and then two hours to take it off. Yeah. So yeah, I you just, don't want to waste your time on car rides I had and a toothbrush and had a shower and yeah. you know, I I, uh, I just stayed there. Yeah. Gate Gab wants to know: um, Is there any particular part that you've wanted to play that you haven't had a chance to yet? That hasn't come along. No, that's interesting. I like to play more people who get the girl. <laughs> uh, and when and when they when I do play people who get the girl, it's like it's like a very it's always been like a very like sweet episode. Like, oh look, he got the girl. Like it's <laughs> like it's some like like heartwarming like make a wish camp something. Like 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 he even even he could get the girl. How do you, how does it feel being cast to a type? I mean, is it irritating or is it something like, you know what, this is, this is kind of my niche. This is my area to play in. Well, you are, you, you know, you are what you are. I, I teach a, I teach a working, a, a, an acting workshop, like once every couple of years for six weeks. And one of the first things I talk about is like, uh, is, is what thing are. And then when you're aware of it, you can create. It, with Willie, it. I lost you. Can you back up an again and, and say what it is that you that you teach in the yeah. class? I lost you. I teach, I teach about I teach about how knowing the physical properties of things, then you can create with them. So that's true with us as individuals. I can play a guy 
who thinks he looks like Brad Pitt to amazing comedy or pathos or whatever. I can't play a guy who looks like Brad Pitt. I look like I look like. But once I'm aware of that, I can now play a guy who thinks he looks like Brad Pitt. <laughs> I can create, I can totally create with that. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, you're, you're in your lane, you know, uh, everyone has their own journey as, as an actor and, and you're going to play what you're going to play. Um, the, sometimes if, you know, I have a pretty wide range, so I get to play a bunch of different kind of characters. Um, and that's, that ends up being, as you get older in your career, that ends up being the battle is like, I know you know me as this, but give me a shot at this. Right. And uh, luckily I've been able to deliver a few times in, in various ways, hopefully. What, what's the role that you're most proud of? You know, I'd say the deepest, the deepest one for me would probably be Mozzie uh, on White Collar. It was the most like myself. I got to write a lot of it. That's where I started directing. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, the producer always says that Willie uses the script like a template, uh, not necessarily as a compliment, by the way. Um, and because I, I would just, I made that role very much my own. And that was really fun to do. It made me feel like a creator rather than just showing up. What ways did you get to expand yourself in, in, in playing that, part that you didn't expect well, I, I got to bring a lot of stuff knowledge from my life uh -huh. experience in my life and write it in um into the character uh and that it was some of it was sneaky and some of it was very obvious like uh during the show i was going through adopting my child so we made mozzie automatically we just made mozzie and an, a foster child that he had been a foster child. So uh, they're like things that we could weave into the show. And that's, that's the glory of going for a lot of episodes. You get, you get more chance to explore, to expand the character. It's not just the, you know, like on sex in the city, it's like the smart one, the slutty one, the, the whatever. But as you go on, these people become real people. That's what's great about a long run. Thank you for sharing that. Dan, 23, what was it like to work with Claudia Black in 200? Oh, great. I mean, Vala. <laughs> yeah, great actress. It was like totally ridiculous, um, the whole situation. And, uh, you know, I have nothing but fond memories of the people there. I, the, the surprise to me was Bo Bridges showing up. Like, mm -hmm. like I thought, even you, even you are in this crazy world. Like, <laughs> Like, I wouldn't be surprised if anyone walked in, you know? What did you think of that 200 script? The framing device is essentially a Treehouse of Horror, Simpsons style thing. Yeah. I mean, how off the wall was that? Were you just, was your head spinning when you read that? It was very obvious that this was a very different episode. <laughs> and which is great. They wanted, that they cared so much. You know, in science fiction, as you know, fans are everything. And that we wanted to give the fans something really special. And they did because look at how, look at how, you know, I only did three episodes. Look how it resonated the with impact. Them. Like this is, you know, what is this? 20 something years later. We're still talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Amazing. Raj. Um, so Brad, Brad Wright is working on uh, uh, developing a, a fourth series. We're, we're just yeah. hoping that it gets greenlit. Uh, would you be interested in, in returning in some capacity? Maybe well, not as Martin, but as something else. This is what character actors do. I talk to Brad sometimes on the, on the Twitter. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what us, that's what the elderly call it. And uh, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's a great world. And again, you know, as, as an actor, besides that you want to tell interesting stories, you want to have a really wide and interesting fan base. And again, these are the best fans in the world. Like, why do you, you know, once you got them, you got them for life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's something that thing. I'm, I'm oh. hopefully not done working yet. So the, the thing about science fiction that I love is that I watched a lot of it when I was a kid, obviously, <laughs> and I reinterpreted as an adult so much of it. 
and more more along the lines of oh this is what they were this is what they intended but i wasn't aware of as a kid that's and, great but also things that apply in my life that the writer didn't even know about where it where it struck home right. and i think not just sci-fi does it the best entertainment does that it's great it's funny you say that because i showed my son a movie that i realized halfway through that i had showed it i had shown it to him like four or five years ago but it had no resonance then but now at 19 he was like all up in it right um, so and it was it was just like he like remembered it he goes oh when i saw that last time that meant nothing to me uh that scene and now it means everything to me you know and that was very cool what's the film porkies no no the, the, the <laughs> film <laughs> Is, um, <laughs> Dead Poet Society. Absolutely. Carpe diem. I wish it was perfect. So. <laughs> oh my God. So you occasionally teach acting classes. Any advice to anyone wanting to get into this field? Which field? Uh, uh, television and film acting. Oh, no, just do it. Do it all the time. Never not do it. Like I was just talking to my son about this. When I came to California... I, I built sets at every crappy theater that I could be involved in. I did small parts in any play that I could do. Um, I, you know, it was a different time. Like you could get up in the morning and drive around town to casting directors offices and drop off pictures and resumes and like go in and maybe get them to say hello to you for a second. You couldn't do that now. They'd call security. Um, so it's all about just practicing and learning and, always being in an, for my, from my field acting, always being in a class, always be doing a play and it doesn't matter where. And there is no job. There's no magical job that makes your career. It's just one after the next. I did really big jobs and then found myself, you know, drinking coffee out of a styrofoam cup at four in the morning uh, for a hundred dollars, like out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, coming off of a really fancy job. So it's a, it's a it's a stack of jobs that makes a career, but the same stack is needed to get to a career. And I would bet that that potentially, you know, some of those less paying, less fanciful jobs provide you with more fulfillment. Sometimes, sometimes, um, sometimes not. Sometimes it's uh, it's people who somehow are shooting something and they were not ready to shoot it. That's the bad experience that most people have. Because you're ready to go and they're not. Yeah. Just because you can direct something doesn't mean that you should be. Right. And that happens a lot. Right. How much how much work did you have to put yourself through? How much schooling, you know, to direct? Uh, I mean, I I didn't direct till I had been standing on sets for 30 years. Yeah. And then I had and then I still had to uh, shadow two directors over two months uh, to see how it's done. And what I learned about, which I did not know, because some of them are so good, what I did not know is the amount of preparation. And that's who I, that's who I studied the most from. I studied most from a guy who had been an assistant director who became a director. So he came at it from a point of preparation and he taught me so much. And that's why I, I was really good at it because I was, a lunatic about preparing. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked with a number of the diff uh, different uh, Stargate directors uh, uh, throughout the the production. And if they didn't get at least two or three weeks, you know, depending on the size of what the, the script was, they could not be ready. You know, it was not physically possible. Right. And then you're playing catch up and you're sitting up all night trying to, you know, look at a scene in act three that, you know, that you didn't get a chance to get to and, you know, whatever. Right. And then editing on top of that, then you have to go with an editor and cut it all together. It's funny though. I like that work. Like I went to direct a sitcom because I thought, Oh, everyone loves to do that. Cause it's easy money. And it's really easy. You work Monday to Friday. That's it. You don't prep. You have two hours of editing. or That's it. But I tried to do this. So I learned how to do it. I shadowed some people and then I went and did an episode and I hated it. Um, it just wasn't for me. It didn't, it wasn't as I'm really making this as I like for really? hour long or yeah. 
Okay. And and by the way, P.S. That episode was nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> the episode That's that you hated. Fun. What yeah. was it again? It was a show called Girl Meets World. Oh, okay, yeah. It was a very special episode. It wasn't a jokey episode. It was an episode about autism and Asperger's. Wow. And uh, a kid on the show, they think he has Asperger's. And uh, so it's a really, you know, it's an emotional episode. And the, the kids were amazing. I grew up with them. I'd done many Boy Meets World. I grew up with these, with all these kids. So I know, I know them really well. And that's why they let me do it. And uh, that, that was their, they, they got nominated for best children's programming that year. And that was the episode that they used to get nominated. Wow. That's really cool, man. Yeah. Willie, I appreciate you um, taking time and stopping by to do, uh, to do our show. You know, Stargate has had some pretty significant milestones. You were definitely in some of, of the bigger ones. And Martin is a character that is very close to my heart and, uh, and, and many fans' hearts out there. So it's a, a pleasure to sit down and talk with you and, and reminisce about, about such a, a satisfying product and, and awesome. a, a great piece of Stargate history. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor. And uh, it's an honor to be in these shows that mean so much to the people who watch them, you know. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate right. your time and you take care of yourself, okay? All right, you take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Willie Garson, everyone. Martin Lloyd on Stargate SG-1. All right. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. But if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We are now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages in a variety of sizes and colors at Rub Bubble. We currently offer four themed designs and hope to add more in the future. The word cloud designs have both a solid background and transparent options, so you have some flexibility in choosing a light or a dark color. So keep that in mind when you're making your selection. And check out is fast and easy. You can use your Amazon or PayPal account. Just visit dialthegate.redbubble.com. And thanks for your support. We are giving away a piece of the Stargate DHD from the Pegasus Galaxy. For the month of February, Dial the Gate is partnering with Empire Movie Props to give away this piece of the DHD from Phantoms. To enter to win, use a desktop or laptop computer and visit dialthegate.com. Scroll down to submit trivia questions. Your trivia may be used in a future episode of Dial the Gate. There's three slots for uh, trivia, one easy, one medium, one hard. Only one needs to be filled in and you're more well than welcome to submit up to three. Uh, the submission form does not currently work for mobile devices. Be sure to get this in before March the 1st, and if you're the lucky winner, I'll be notifying you via your email. Big thanks to Empire Movie Props for making this item available to a member of our audience. I do have a couple of questions uh, that I've been meaning to get to. Uh, Teresa MC, uh, Jason Momoa, I understand, is an accomplished artist. Do you have any of your of his works? I do not have actually any of of uh, Jason's pieces. Tom Hudson, what is the spacesuit in the background? What movie is that from? That is from a show called Stargate Universe, and that is Matthew Scott's space suit from Destiny. So SU is a good show. You should check it out. All right. And um, can we talk about getting our paws on the Shepard McKay yeah. Harmony portrait for giveaways? That portrait was actually uh, uh, sold at PropWorks. It was about six feet tall, if I remember correctly. Absolutely an enormous, uh, enormous thing. And I can't remember how much it went for. But that information's on liveauctioneers.com. Next week's guest lineup. So we have four coming your way this coming weekend and two are on Saturday and two are on Sunday. Gary Jones interviews uh, another fan, Christina, and that'll be premiering February 27th at noon PST, followed by Richard Woolsey himself, Robert Picardo. He's going to be joining us on February the 27th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. And then on February the 28th, Sunday, at 1 p.m. Pacific time, we have James Bamford, who's going to be joining us. He was the stunt coordinator on Stargate Atlantis and the fight coordinator on Stargate SG-1. So Bam Bam is going to be stopping by at 1 p.m. on Sunday. 3 p.m. Pacific time, Simone Bailey, one of my favorites. 
Kalel on Stargate SG-1. She was also a background player in uh, Stargate Universe as well, which I didn't even realize until a couple, three uh, months ago when we had her on in uh, 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 one of our first episodes for Dial the Gate. I think that that's pretty much everything that I have for you here. I always feel like I'm leaving something out. Um, if you're enjoying our show, please consider uh, giving us a like and subscribing uh, or leaving a comment saying, you know, what you think about it, because the algorithm behaves uh, more positively to the series uh, when there's interaction in the videos, gets us uh, up front in front of more Stargate fans. So it really makes a, a big difference, and I appreciate you taking the time. That's all we've got for this weekend. Next weekend, those four shows are going to be heading your way. My thanks again to Willie Garson for a, uh, a, a great a, uh, a great interview, a great time to have him, uh, that we've had him on. Uh, thanks to Linda Fury, Gate Gabber, for all of her hard work. And um, uh, my mod team, Summer, Tracy, Keith, uh, Jeremy, Rees, you guys are fantastic. Thanks to Jennifer Kirby. Uh, all of you make this show possible, and all of you watching, uh, Give us a reason to keep on doing more of these. My name is David Reed. Thanks for watching Dial the Gate. I'll see you on the other side.